Okay, this is going to be the first official training video loaded up over on Rumble. It will also be loaded over to the backup channel over on BitChute. If you're wondering where the backup channel is, here you go. The address will be in the description. Also there you will find a listing for the Patreon channel. If you like what I do, come over to Patreon and kick me your buck or two. I use the money to purchase supplies and equipment for the militia unit I am in. Now, this video that we are going to be doing today is on World War I area, era, Livens Projector. This was copied by the Imperial German Army with the name Gaswerfminen, or gas weapon mine thrower, basically. Now, this was created by a Captain William Livens of the Royal Engineers in 1916. When he originally designed this, it is a simple mortar, and he designed it to toss flame shells into enemy trenches to burn them out. They found that flames were the best and most effective weapon for use against dug-in enemy troops, against their bugger from bunkers and so forth, and against their dugouts. But the British Army, being the way they are, they realized, hey, instead of just launching flame shells, we can toss poison gas. So the Levin's projector you will find listed in history as a gas mortar because that turned into the primary shell they used. Listings for the other types of rounds that were developed, used, and deployed in World War I are obviously high explosive. They experimented with that. It was a mix. They also had the uh, flame mix, which was oil and cotton waste pellets. They also used crude thermite. They would also toss white phosphorus. There was also what's referred to as a stink bomb, which was created after this became primarily a chemical munitions launcher. This was a stink munition that would uh, burn your nostrils and stuff. It wouldn't kill you. They would launch those stink bombs, and that's what they called them, was stink bombs, onto the enemy trenches, get them confused, and while the uh, troops are putting on their gas masks, then the British troops would, in theory, come up over the top, bayonets fixed, catching the German troops while they're still putting on the gas mask and their rifles sitting off to the side. They also had smoke rounds, which were primarily used in training because you're not going to fire actual chemical munitions when you're training back at the homeland, will you? Now, the first initial model I found that they created on this that uh, Livens was experimenting with, he used a three-gallon oil drum, which had a diameter of about 12 inches. This was really improvised, but he tested it out, proved the basic concept, and then decided to step it up and improve it. The second version he used, he used an 8-inch oxyacetylene tank. Obviously, no gas in the tank anymore. He uh, inverted it so that the end that the gas gauge would go on would become the bottom, removed the gauge, plugged it, and then welded that plug in place, and then cut off the bottom to open it up so he had the nice open tube on this. The length of the Livens projector when they were being manufactured was approximately one meter in length. They did produce three different models but when you look the stuff up online they just say they're each one meter in length. The only difference was a few inches between your small, medium, and large projectors that they were producing and sending into France. Now, these were electrically initiated. So we had electrical igniter down in the propellant charge for setting it off. That's the only way you could ignite it. There was no touch hole on here that you put a fuse in like on a cannon and then light it off. If you did it that way, then the uh, sides of our tube here would not be thick enough and you just have a giant uh, explosion. But setting it off as uh, electric initiation you have no openings down here at what essentially is your breach. So you got nowhere that it, in theory, would breach out. But you always had to be uh, prepared for the possibility that one of these would crack and detonate 
when you're trying to use it. Now, from what I found on the produc production ones, the tube itself was about 100 pounds. Remember, they're using oxyacetylene tanks. You got thicker walls on those tanks. The base plate alone, which was made out of quarter inch steel, was around 28 pounds. So it itself is a big heavy bastard. This thing is basically square, concave in the center. Here, I can do a good example. Think of like this. See how it bows down in the center? This is essentially what the base plate would look like. You have the opening in the center here that the tube would sit down on. And then you have the sides which were crimped down, which would sit in the ground, supporting it so that this part wasn't directly down on the ground. If you tried putting it in the ground like this, it can rock any which direction. So you got the sides here that would make it more stable along the lines of what we use in mortars now. Now, what they would do with these, these would be in place behind friendly trenches. So they would be out of observation of the enemy troops from their trench and from their observation balloons. They would put these in at night, go through, dig out a trench, and these were typically put in in clusters of about 25. And they would just put in a big string of them. Dig out a trench, you got the flat back here, which is at a steeper angle. Your front of your trench, which is towards the enemy, is approximately 45 degrees. Now, before, after they would put in the projector, they'd first put in the base plate, then they'd put in the tube. They had an inclinometer a small little piece of wood that they would put on there and it would let them know when it's at a 45 degree angle if they had to lower it or raise it to get the 45. All the firing tables for this were set for the 45 degree angle. After they got it put in place they would go through, take the spoil from the trench, put it over the launcher or the projector using their terminology. Originally, they would go right up to a couple inches from the end here, covering the whole thing with spoil, even if they had to dig some from somewhere else and bring it in to cover it up. But they realized what they had to cover, and pretty much the only thing they had to cover, was essentially where your breech is down here, where the propellant charge is. So they just made sure they had a good, safe foot of earth and packed it in over the top and a little bit underneath to support it so that this will not blow out. Now for loading this, the first thing they would put in there is the propellant charge. And the propellant charge came inside a can that was three pieces. You had the bottom casing, you had the cover which was called the gas check, and then you would have the propellant bags inside. One of those propellant bags would be wired up with the igniter. Now the propellant they were using was just basic smokeless powder is what I came across. And these bags were four and eight ounce packs. I'm just looking here to make sure if I can find a note. So yep, up to 32 ounces of propellant could be used inside the projector to get the maximum range. The, uh, so you could go from four ounces to 32 ounces. Some of your bags were eight ounce bags. Some of, most of them were four ounce bags. One of them would be primed with your igniter. You'd put in whatever amount of bags is required to get the range that you want run the lead up over the top through a little notch and can here, out, put the gas check on, and it would sit together as its little can. You would put the propellant can down inside, making sure to run the electrical lead along the top edge of the projector, out from the projector and then up over the top, and it would be run back to the main firing wire tied in all the projectors in that little section of it usually they did it it looked like in groups of five all five wires coming through to one wire 
and then that one main firing wire would go back to the firing position and you'd have five other firing positions in that trench and your giant series wired up to either your blast machine or a battery when you're going to launch it. You're not going to attach the uh, blast machine or the battery to the firing wire while you're setting it up obviously. But after you got the leads in here, it's sitting off the back. It would be unshunted. They're taken apart. You would then put in your cylinder, your ammunition, your propellant charge. Now you had on this the burster, which was a big rod, really about as long as my, uh, maybe a little bit longer, as my mine probe. The top part of it was the, a crude impact fuse, and then you had an artillery bursting charge from an artillery shell was attached to the fuse, and the whole thing was screwed into the canister under this big channel. Now, they did have, it said uh, when these were getting filled in the field, you would fill them from the back it, when they were using the chemical munitions and flame munitions. They had a fill plug on the back, a little plug on the back here and then it have the little ports going into the tank so they're pouring the chemicals inside it would hit that little plug here and they would fill it up so you'd have it upside down fill it then they would put a cap over the back here which would be a little bit thicker of a plug to keep the filler inside and then when they're up at the firing position they're getting ready to load it they would screw in the burster charge and the fuse then it would put the whole thing down into the projector, seating it down on the top of the gas check over the propellant charge. Now this gas check, when this would get fired, this is actually designed to expand out to right up on the edges of the tube. Think of a shotgun wad sealing the gas behind it so nothing is going to spill out around the edges of your canister and then that gas check is really what's pushing the canister forward up out of the mortar <clears throat> the bottom of this uh, propellant charge the, pro the bottom casing as far as i can figure out when these bags go off it's going to deform basically collapsing inward a bit so that you'll be able to pull it out. The gas check would get propelled up and out of the projector, land somewhere downrange, and then your canister would go out to the range that it's set for, you could say. Now the minimum range for one of these projectors is 910 yards, and that is with the 4 ounce charge. <clears throat> to a maximum, according to the U.S. Army, of 1,450 yards, but the British Army said they were able to get theirs out to a maximum of 1,800 yards. Why the difference? I don't know. Maybe it's the grade of propellant. I can't say. Now, some uh, general information on the impact area. It's frontage, so the side facing you from a battery of 25 launchers set out in a string, it would cover approximately a 225 yard frontage, going back from the first ch charge to the rear charge of approximately 150 yards. Now, as I said, this is regulated by the propellant. All this is in the firing tables, inside the technical manual, which you can find, it's online if you want to research this. Now they had a plus, plus or minus on the distance going out falling short, so going long falling short of plus or minus 25 yards. And depending on the wind and the weight of the shell and every little variation on how the, the launcher is placed, it could be a plus or minus 35 yards to the left or the right. They found through testing and also after action reports, 96% of the shots would land in that square of 225 yards by 150. Now, why am I bringing this up? This is something that uh, left the inventories at the beginning of World War II because they no longer 
were using chemical munitions as the war went on. But you know, there's some things I don't want to talk about it about the gas grenades, poison gas grenades and stuff like that being used. And then also we know the Holocaust. But actual barrages of enemy fortifications of chemical weapons was not performed. If you look at the footage from Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Ukraine, you're going to see them making improvised cannons. And if you look at them real closely, take a guess what they look like, except they're on a wheeled carriage, and they're a little bit bigger. So this is, this old Livens projector, it's been resurrected, and it's being used in guerrilla conflicts around the world. And it's not that difficult. It was designed by a soldier in the field using what was readily available. So, there you go, a little piece of engineering uh, ordinance here for you to think about. Now, as always, and this is in the description also, do not make one of these except in a without rule of law situation. Society is completely broken down. We have aliens invading. We got Chinese paratroopers falling from the sky. You make one of these and you test it out even for fun, you're making a weapon that uh, it falls under federal codes. You don't have the proper permits, which I guarantee you won't. You'll sooner or later get caught and you'll go to federal pokey for a long time. But after a conflict has begun and we've said F the laws, well, now you got an idea for a improvised mortar. I highly do not recommend making the gas shells, but you can do the original route, like Captain Livens had intended, launching flame fluids, like was later employed by the Foo Gas, which Limit Livens is one of the people that's attributed or accredited to its creation. And they did experiment with high explosive shells also. So some improvised, some HME in there, homemade explosive, you know, that landing on the heads of Chinese communist troops inside one of their uh, base camps or in a logger site. Hey, it'll cause them a bad day. These are not accurate at all in any way, shape, or form because these shells are not stabilized. They do not rotate. So they're not going to keep their trajectory real well. They're also not fin stabilized to keep them going straight ahead. The wind will push them to the left, to the right potentially down if you're doing it in the rain and the rain's hitting it good enough you know it could add that extra weight that'll slowly push it down and drop your range but little neat piece of ordnance history those of you that are trying to find explanations on it if you want to find out more information on this i suggest checking out uh, this particular manual from world war ii technical manual 3-325 Publication date of 1942. The title on it is Livens Projector MI or Mark I or M1. People really kind of, looks like no one really knows what they meant on here. I think it's meant to be Mark I. But that's, when you look it up, it'll say Livens Projector MI. Now, for all my engineer brothers in the Patriot and Militia movements, always remember, essay ons.